Well, good evening, everybody. For those who don't know me, I'm Quentin Cobb and uh, Chair and Events Organiser for the Society. Um, I'm delighted tonight to introduce you to Chris Bloomore, um, a professor at Monmouth University in New Jersey, who's currently in the UK in uh, Newcastle, uh, where she's a Leaver Hume visiting professor. And uh, over to you, Chris. Unmute. Ah. Unmute, and now I'm going to share my screen. So everybody should be able to see a cover slide. I'm going to yep, that's fine. go like this from beginning and then, all right, so welcome everyone. I'm Chris Blumel and as you can see, Orwell and Feminism is my subject today. I think most of you are old hands at this Zoom presenting business, but if the column of images, of video images of the participants is obscuring the slide in a way that irritates you, remember you can go to the upper right hand corner and you can minimize the faces so that the slides are really dominant on your screen and they shouldn't, you know, it should have, it's mainly pictures, but um, just a little tip. I think we can all agree that George Orwell did not like feminism and produced no feminist writings. This is not to say that he is uninteresting or even unnecessary to feminist thinkers and feminist critics, whether of his day or ours. Nor does this mean that he scorned the conversations, companionship or assistance of individual feminist women. In fact, quite the opposite is true whether constructed out of private documents, hidden in archives or public commentaries published during or after Orwell's lifetime, the story of Orwell's relationship with feminism reveals ties that are as strong, persistent and productive as any he forged with other political movements and ideologies. In this talk on Orwell and feminism, I will attempt to map out several of the most important critical consequences of the vexed contradictory and more than century long relationship between Orwell and feminism for 21st century feminist and non-feminist readers by asking simply and cheerfully, what has Orwell done for feminism? What has feminism done and what might it do for Orwell? By asking what feminism has done and might do for Orwell, I really mean what might feminism do for Orwell studies. In this, I resort to a shorthand that we Orwell scholars perhaps too cavalierly adopt, conflating the word Orwell or images of Orwell with George Orwell's writing and the writing of so many others who have found themselves working within a political or cultural orbit defined by his ideas. I assume that Orwell has included us all in his political literary legacy by virtue of his reputation, the influence and aura of his words that mystically exceed limits to what, what might once have been his merely personal desires and intentions. More problematic in asking what Orwell has done for feminism and what feminism might do for Orwell, I conflate and artificially unify within the term feminism, diverse histories of thought, and multiple dynamic, often fracturing political groups um, and movements organized in only the most general way around the idea of advancing rights of women. For example, if we look to ideas and behaviors around sex and gender maintained by real and fictional women closest to Orwell, uh, we see not only diversity, but even incompatibility of feminist belief. Orwell's aunt Nellie Lemusen was a self-professed proud and active feminist who in defiance of all convention lived on and off for years with her socialist Esperantist lover, Eugene Adam. His mother, Ida Blair, adopted bohemian habits and maintained, quote, a great enthusiasm for women's rights. Orwell's wife, Eileen O'Shaughnessy was not a feminist, although she donned trousers and braved death with her husband in defense of the Spanish Republic. Orwell's Dorothy Hare and the clergyman's daughter similarly defies gendered conventions, embarking on independent brain-addled tramps through London and Kent, but she is no feminist. 
nor is Orwell's most famous and defiant heroine, Julia, in 1984. She may be a rebel from the waist downwards, but she's not a feminist, lacking ideas about gender oppression and sexual rights, just as she lacks any other political philosophy. Orwell's friends and associates, as well as those scholars who have studied Orwell's women characters, have varied in the degree of their critique of his fictional representations of female sex and feminine gender. Brenda Salkeld said in a 1960 BBC interview, he didn't really like women. I used to bring up the women who I thought were good writers, and he would very occasionally praise their writing, but he used to say it stuck in his throat to have to do it. Jacintha Buttercombe, the only person to have left us a memoir of social encounters with Orwell as a youth, judges that his, quote, novels appear to prove that Brenda Salkeld was right when she said that when she knew him, he didn't understand women and by then didn't really like them. But it comes judgment might advance feminist thinking about Orwell's literary legacy, but it's not a feminist judgment. It does not draw from or aim at ideological meaning or political action, yet it is a vital necessary judgment for feminist Orwell studies to grapple with. This is because, as many of you know, Buttercombe's literary legacy, in particular her 1972 letter to a young woman relative that claimed that Orwell hurt and nearly raped her in 1921, immediately prior to his departure, departure for Burma, raises with her description of the young Orwell sexual violence the high stakes of analyzing relations between Orwell's writing, his legacy extended through others writing about him, and his personal history as a sexual pursuer and at times sexual harasser. To the extent that Orwell scholars dodge, diminish, or deny the importance of Buttercombe's and other women's reports of Orwell's habit of sexual predation for understanding and navigating Orwell's legacy, we know what feminism might still do for Orwell. To this extent also, feminism can still learn from Orwell a writer who always sought to name the highest stakes of any high stakes relationship and never feared the personal, social, or political consequences of criticizing others who defied his sense of righteous decency. Indecent women. 1984 was a banner year for feminist Orwell studies as it was for just about every other kind of Orwell study. Beatrix Campbell's incomparable Wigan and Peary visited poverty and politics in the 80s came out roaring under the Virago Press imprint, while Daphne Pattaya's The Orwell Mystique, a study in male ideology, um, competed with support, completed with support of the American Council of Learned Societies under a grant from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, came out with the University of Massachusetts Press. Also important was Audrey Copard and Bernard Crick's Orwell Remembered, which included more women's voices, more writing by women than any other anthology or study devoted to Orwell published prior to Nathan Waddell's forthcoming edition of the Oxford Handbook of George Orwell. A treasure trove for feminist scholars eager to understand how women interpreted and publicly represented their relations to George Orwell, Copard and Crick's volume made readily accessible the feelings and reflections of Orwell's mother, Ida Blair, his sister, Avril Dunn, his niece, Jane Morgan, his son's nanny, Susan Watson, his girlfriends, Jacintha Buttercombe, Ruth Pitter, and Kay Eckthall, and his women friends and associates, Brenda Salkeld, Mabel Fierce, May Diner, Latisse Cooper, and Margaret Nelson. This treasure trove operates on the level of memory and desire of cultural and biographical history. It does not pretend to be scholarship, and it does not answer scholar Anna Vaninskaya's um, protest in an article called The Orwell Century and After, Rethinking Reception and Reputation. But what about Orwell as literature? Campbell could not be accused of missing the Orwellian literary center as her journey and book, Wigan Peer Revisited, places Orwell's great documentary of mass poverty in the English North during the depression at the fore of her project. In the first place, she embeds the familiar keywords of Orwell's documentary title in her own book's title and uh, cites Orwell's book in the epigraphs that frame each of her chapters. 
In the second place, she finds in the road to Wigan Pier the motivation and routing of the physical journey that supports her record of her own political literary quest. Campbell tells her readers that all she and Orwell share is, quote, a point of departure, his book. Yet this is enough to ensure that readers of her book will rotate around the literary center, Orwell as literature, that Van Inskaya invokes. Campbell assumes that her readers share her literary knowledge of the key terms, characters, and narrative structures of The Road to Wigan Pier, but clarifies at the outset what separates her and her book from Orwell and his Wigan Pier. He was an upper-class old Etonian, a Southern ex-colonial, uh, colonial, excuse me. I'm from the North, from the working class. Like him, I'm white. I'm a jobbing journalist. Unlike him, I'm a feminist. I grew up among the kind of communists and socialists who guided him into the working class communities and who staffed some of their struggles. Politics is to me what privilege was to him. Class and region are the first categories of difference that Campbell emphasizes. Race and profession, namely whiteness and journalism, appear as categories of similarity. Yet whether category of identification or difference, all these social categories do not tell us anything in advance about what matters to most to each writer, namely their politics. The first political category that Campbell specifies in the above passage, the one I just read aloud, is her feminism. And it is her feminist politics, more so than her communist or socialist politics, that provide the critical standpoint advancing her most trenchant critique of the sources and structures of poverty in the 80s. Already we have one answer to the question, what has Orwell done for feminism? Orwell has given feminism Beatrix Campbell's Wig and Peer Revisited. Without Orwell, we'd never be able to read and revisit Campbell's valuable documentary of her encounters with mass poverty during her travels through the Midlands, the Northeast, South Yorkshire, and Lancashire in 1982, at the peak of Britain's Second Great Depression and Britain's second wave of feminism. Nor would we hear her conversations with working class men and women, but especially women, and that's a quote from her book, uh, those who hosted her in working class homes in Coventry, Sunderland, Barnsley, and Wigan. What Campbell's feminism does for Orwell studies 50 years after publication of The Road to Wigan Pier, and now 40 years after Wigan Pier Revisited, is urge us to listen differently by listening for difference in the kinds of working class voices that guided Orwell through industrial England, giving him a voice of his own. That Campbell's lesson still has value for Orwell studies is evident in something as modest as an index check in John Newsinger's relatively recent study, Hope Lies in the Proles, George Orwell and the Left. That was published 2018. Feminism earns no entry in his index. And while Campbell, comma, Beatrix is accorded an indexical entry, Readers may be surprised to find no mention of her feminism, the very politics that lie at the center of her expose of poverty and politics in the 80s. Instead, we read that Campbell is, quote, coming at Orwell from a CP perspective. Newsinger doesn't register the sexual difference that makes all the difference to an informed understanding of Campbell's feminist critique. Feminism more than CP bias disorients Campbell from Orwell's politics as it disorients her from her own class. This is because being, this is Campbell, being a feminist puts a woman both inside and outside the mainstream of working class politics, which are stewed in sexual prejudice and privilege, unquote. And one of the most important passages of her book, Campbell explains. So, while committing me to my own class, my politics also has its own critique of working class life and institutions. But unlike Orwell, my journey didn't make me repudiate my own class. It did the opposite. It recuperated my class belonging. The men and women I met often spoke of regret and loss, an unnamed, unacknowledged loss of something that never was, a kind of melancholy, a mourning for unspecified neglect, the neglect of a socialism spoiled by superstition, subordination, and sexism. Yet they also speak of resilience and creative intervention in life, particularly for women. 
This passage describes with, with tenderness and subtlety Campbell's feminist critique of working class life and institutions as it also describes her feminist recuperation of working class belonging. The source of both critique and affirmation, detachment and affiliation are the words of working men and women that testify to the feelings of loss, to the collective mourning of a socialism spoiled by superstition, subordination, and sexism. Socialism is not spoiled by Campbell's feminism, but by its refusal of feminism. It's refusal to listen to men and women who, in order to name and acknowledge the sexism that systematically subordinates all socialists. Similarly, Orwell is not spoiled by Campbell's feminism, let alone her socialism. Rather, she forges through feminism the means and methods that promise to recuperate Orwell for men and women who might find themselves feeling subordinated in his writing and through his politics. This recuperation may take place if and when those of us who speak about Orwell adopt Campbell's methods and listen for the unnamed, unacknowledged loss of something that never was in his politics, a politics that was spoiled by superstition, subordination, and sexism. To write out feminism in discussion of Campbell's feminist intervention in Orwell studies is to condemn Orwell studies to a kind of fatal melancholy and mourning that overwhelms the promises of resilience and creative intervention in life that Orwell's comedy, satires, and even his tragedies extend. Daphne Pattai's more scholarly, more famous, or infamous feminist study, The Orwell Mystique, makes the same kind of observation as Campbell's about Orwell's Wigan Pier. No matter how sympathetic Orwell's image of impoverished, miserable women, such as the iconic image of the Wigan Pier slum girl who at, is 25 and looks 40, poking a stick up a blocked waste pipe, Orwell's contacts with women are limited to viewing them at some distance. He does not speak to them, does not explore their lives or possibilities as he does the men's. Orwell's elimination of working women's voices from his documentary are part of a pattern that Patai discovers through close readings of all of Orwell's major works of idealized what she calls hypertrophied masculinity. This is of Orwell's cultivation of traditional notions of masculinity complemented by a generalized misogyny. And th that again, that's the language back in 84 of Daphne Patai. Just as important as her diagnosis of androcentrism and misogyny is Patai's conclusion that Orwell's despair is a result of a narrow worldview that followed from his polarized vision of manly men and womanly men, women. In this, Bataille is like Campbell, finding through feminist analysis the source of and solution to negative feelings of sadness, grief, and mourning in the writing and politics of Orwell and of patriarchal communities more generally. Unrespectable women. Much of the outcry against Pattaya's thesis came from readers who saw it as their job to defend Orwell against the charge of misogyny. Few at that time showed signs of having read Pattaya's definition of misogyny, elaborated upon in a footnote, and none showed signs of having read much of the feminist scholarship and theory that had by then become central to the work of academic disciplines and institutions. Misogyny, says Pattaya, citing at length an early second wave feminist study by Catherine M. Rogers, is not only direct expressions of hatred, fear, or contempt of womankind, but such indirect expressions as misogynistic speeches by dramatic characters who are definitely speaking for the author, and condemnations of one woman or type of woman, which spread implicitly or explicitly to the whole sex, as well as attacks on human follies or vices which focus inappropriately or disproportionately on women. Patai joins Rogers in declining to find evidence of misogyny in the mere expression of a widely held belief such that women are inferior to men, but only when, and this is a quote, as is indeed the case with Orwell, an author insists on such a view with a harshness that is exceptional, even for his time. Perhaps some of those who resisted Patai's assessment found Orwell's sexism, his view of women as inferior to men, as unexceptional for his time and therefore not misogynistic. 
Yet these accounts largely neglect comparative analysis of Orwell's and his contemporaries' literary representations of women. These contemporaries would include not only male writers he socialized with, like H.G. Wells and Cyril Connolly and Anthony Pohl, but uh, those who were active at the same time, including James Joyce, Ian e. Forrester, J.B. Priestley, John Summerfield, Lewis Grassic Gibbon, Walter Greenwood, and Walter Brierley. They would also include women writers who knew Orwell, like Stevie Smith, Inez Holden, Ruth Pitter, Lydia Jackson, and Letice Cooper, and the broader group of feminist women writers active at the time, including Virginia Woolf, Naomi Mitchison, Catherine Burdekin, and Ethel Carney Holtzworth. All of these writers advanced through their literature ideas about gender and sexual relations that make Orwell's views appear exceptionally harsh, even for his time. To consider again for the sake of argument, John Newsinger's Hope Lies in the Proles. While referring to Pattaya's Orwell mystique as, quote, essential, without doubt one of the most important books ever written on Orwell, unquote, Newsinger struggles to integrate the, quote, irrefutable evidence of Orwell's sexism with Pattaya's analysis of his misogyny. So, for example, he argues that Julia, widely held by feminist critics to be a mindless creature of masculine fantasizing, sexy, available, and disposable, is a feminist problem of the 80s, not in the 1940s. Quote, placed back in the context of the time he wrote, Orwell's defense of Julia's defiant and subversive stand in favor of promiscuity and women's sexual pleasure, as demonstrated by Winston Smith's endorsement of that stand, is pretty much unique in the literature of the time. And again, that's John Newsom. So I'm arguing that it's possible to see Julia as nearly unique 1940s feminist heroine, only if one hasn't read much literature by the period's women writers or feminist men writers. Nick Hubble, in The Proletarian Answer to the Modernist Problem, provides numerous examples of women characters from literature of the period who equal or exceed Julia as representations of autonomous, active, desiring people. For example, he describes Naomi Mitchison's 1935 novel, We Have Been Warned, as representing not only May Day marches, parliamentary elections, a socialist revolution, and a fascist uprising, but also free love, rape, and abortion. He comments that the entwined socialist and feminist politics were unmissable and alienated just about everybody. We Have Been Warned was panned by reviewers and damaged Mitchison's literary reputation, but as Hubble points out, this did not prevent the 87-year-old Mitchison in the year 1984 from urging feminist publisher Virago to reprint this, quote, disastrous novel, unquote. If Mitchison is an extreme feminist case, an unfair standard to hold up for any man writing in 1940s England, then Walter Greenwood can serve as a model of a male contemporary of Orwell's capable of imagining women characters whose humanity is defined by diverse desires, including but not exclusively sexual desires for men. Hubble singles out Greenwood's Sally Hardcastle from Love on the Dole as a working class woman character a prole, quote unquote, whose material desires are the driving force of the novel. Hubble cites Sally's defiant refusal of respectability, her self-liberating, communally empowering refusal of feminist, feminine decency, as that decency is defined by her conventional father, who calls her a brazen slut. In a tense scene of intergenerational confrontation, Sally represents the promiscuous woman whose sexuality outside of wedlock takes on new meanings in Greenwood's complex intersectional imaginings derived from his experiences of poverty and politics in 1930s Britain. So here's the hardest part of my talk where with my American accent, I'm gonna to try to read. <laughs> representation of a working class 1930s woman. So you'll just have to be forgiving. Here we go. I'm pretending to be Sally. It's sick I am a codging old clothes to make them look summit like. And sick I am a working week after week and seeing not for it. I'm sick of never having not but what's been in pawn shop. 
Hardcastle narrowed his eyes. See, you'd go horrin' and make respectable folk like me and your ma the talk of the neighborhood, eh? Damn me, you ain't fit to be my daughter. Yeah, who cares what folks say? There's none I know as wouldn't swap places with me if they'd chance. Well, can you get our Harry a job? I can, and I'm not respectable. New Singer argues that by the middle 40s, Orwell was becoming more sensitive in his arguments regarding gender issues. And while deprecating his reaction, these are quotes from New Singer, quote, reactionary, obscene attitudes towards contraception, birth control, and abortion, New Singer finds solace in the idea of the pro woman singing as she pegs out innumerable diapers in the court below Charrington's hideaway in 1984. So here's a quote many of us are very familiar with. As he looked at the woman in her characteristic attitude, her thick arms reaching up from the line, her powerful mare-like buttocks protruded, it struck him for the first time that she was beautiful. It had never before occurred to him that the body of a woman of 50, blown up to monstrous dimensions by childbearing, then hardened, roughened by work till it was coarse like the grain, like an over, excuse me, it was coarse in the grain like an overripe turnip, could be beautiful. She had had her momentary flowering, a year perhaps of wild rose beauty, and then she had suddenly swollen like a fertilized fruit and grown hard and red and coarse. And then her life had been laundering, scrubbing, darning, cooking, sweeping, polishing, mending, scrubbing, laundering, first for children, then for grandchildren, for over 30 unbroken years. And at the end of it, she was still singing. New Singer concludes, hopefully, for all his undoubted sexism, in the end, Orwell chooses a working class woman hanging out the washing as a symbol of the working class power that was to overthrow the world of the hope that the future belonged to the proles. To this one might point out with earlier feminist critics that one unnamed working class female functioning not at the end but two thirds of the way through the novel as generative mother archetype and sentimental symbol barely disrupts the pattern of sexist representation and social world building maintained over books of decades. Back in 1984, Patai observed that Orwell views the singing pro woman in what is for him a positive way. And she agrees with New Singer's assessment that Winston Smith at certain points feels hope for the future resides in these maternal figures. But having said this about Orwell's character, she's not so swayed by Orwell's critics who seem to take up Winston's hopes as a guide and argue that Orwell attributes to women a crucial role in the maintenance of human dignity. It's harder to accept Orwell's idea of human dignity represented in a symbolic, monstrous, turnip-like maternal figure when we compare the nameless Kroll woman to Greenwood Sally Hardcastle. Such comparison shows that male writers of Orwell's generation could communicate in fictional representations of women, some of the complex, complex intersectional workings of class, sex, and gender that Orwell's sexism might have hid from him. That this was a problem in the 1940s as well as the 1980s is evident from the records we have of people in Orwell's day regretting his attitudes. New Singer cites biographer Gordon Bowker's assessment that, quote, the many shrewd women who knew him, even while being deeply fond of him and acknowledging his brilliance, almost invariably referred to his sadism, his seeing women as inferior, or his seeing them as sexually necessary, but of little worth beyond that, unquote. Unruly women. Apart from Ben Clark's Orwell in Context, Communities, Myths, Values, I know of no book-length work of feminist scholarship devoted to analysis of Orwell's life or writing since Bataille came out with her study in 1984. There have been insightful shorter feminist publications on Orwell's literature and important biographies of Orwell's two wives, Eileen O'Shaughnessy and Sonia Braunel, but for sustained answers to the question, what has feminism done and what might it do for Orwell, we would be wise to look outside of Orwell studies to feminist scholarship on the period's literature. 
two studies in the 1990s are particularly valuable for modeling innovative feminist approaches to Orwell. Jan Montefiore's Men and Women Writers of the 1930s, The Dangerous Flood of History, and Alison Light's Forever England, Femininity, Literature, and Conservatism Between the Wars. The former's embrace of men and women writers shares Campbell's feminist commitment to gender and sex inclusive criticism, while the latter prompts us to translate for our own feminist work on Orwell's text, Light's feminist methods worked out among the words and lives of four of Orwell's most successful female contemporaries. The origins of Montefiore's book can be found in a question posed by a sixth form teenager back in 1983. Were there any women writing then? The student was responding to a talk that Montefiore had given on the political literary context of the 30s. And at that time, Robert, Robin Skelton's Poetry of the 30s, which some of you may remember, uh, with its single woman poet, Anne Riddler, among 46 men poets, defined the field for prospective A-level exam takers. Montefiore's book answers the, questions, the student's question indirectly with extended analyses of Orwell's literature, as well as the literature of many other men and women writers of the 1930s. Montefiore's interest in left-wing politics of the 1930s writing led her to writers who were both political and oppositional, including especially political and oppositional women. Such inclusion constructs a literary history whose players upend existing canons and bring alternative political and cultural formations into view. So for example, Orwell and Virginia Woolf, rarely mentioned on the same page or even in the same book, are seen by Montefiore as ideological allies in their attack in remarkably similar terms on the literature of the 1930s, which they defined as the poetry of the Auden group, plus a few prose writers. Montefiore herself, quote unquote, attacks Orwell's 1940 essay, Inside the Whale, because Orwell's stature as a master of plain blunt prose has lent the essay's dismissive judgments and influence on later perceptions of the 30s out of all proportion to their merits. This argument and the close readings that support it demonstrate what Orwell can do for feminism. He can inspire feminist inquiries into a period's unrespectable, unruly oppositional literature that shamelessly puts into question the standard literary critical assumption that politics and literature shouldn't mix. In Montefiore's hands, feminism also does good work on behalf of Orwell studies, as it leads to the insight that the feminist wolf's The Leaning Tower at the level of gender and class politics does the same thing as Orwell's Inside the Whale. Later, Montefiore reveals an unlikely political alliance between Orwell and the poets of the autumn generation, whom he criticizes in Inside the Whale. Whether educated at Eton, Repton, or Gresham School, all tend to assume that their case histories represent the experience of a whole middle-class generation. A pervasive assumption of universal masculinity is evident in everything from Auden's letter to Lord Byron, to Isherwood's Lions and Shadows, to Orwell's Wigan Pier, with the latter's unquestioned assumption that the worker means the male worker. Yet another kind of feminist challenge to histories of 1930s literature emerges from consideration of White's study of small c conservatism between the wars in the fictions of middle-class English women writers. A leftist of working class origins whose childhood play among the bomb sites and rapt attention to tales of the Blitz fostered deep affections for the sodalities and solidarities which the 20th century has created, Light found her subject to contemplation of the largest gaps in histories of 20th century British life, quote, those which the careless masculinity of its writers continue to create. She objects to the long pattern of male authors, including Orwell, being taken to represent the nation, as well as those who are disaffiliated from it. Like Montefiore, she objects to the limitations of women's writing and women's history as critical categories, although her focus on four women writers, Dorothy Sayers, Agatha Christie, Jan Sprother, and Daphne du Maurier, endorses what she sees as a reasonable enough way of signaling a desire for something more as well as something other, for a less complacent history, one made on disagreements and disturbances rather than homogeneity and unity. 
here, expression of a desire for something more, for disagreements and disturbances, represents the emotions of a feminist scholar contemplating grand structures of nation, history, politics, and culture. But they also contain within them the echo of Sally Hardcastle's words. I'm sick and never have a knot but what's been in pawn shop. Yeah, who cares what folks say? I'm not respectable. Such obstinate, unruly, or unrespectable women's desires exceed mere sexual desire to include everything from dress to housewares, to foodstuffs, to housing, transportation, health, and happiness. These last are the interior things, the feelings that indicate belonging rather than exile found in conservative women's writing. And these are the feelings that help light fill in another gap in knowledge of the mid-century, so important to our continuing understanding of Orwell and his legacy, that of conservatism as a set of attitudes and beliefs or, of, or complex of emotional and intellectual responses. Quoting Lord Hugh Cecil's Conservatism, 1912, Light provides a framework for explaining what otherwise looks like Orwell's perverse hypocrisy or lazy contradiction. Quote, the two sentiments of desire to advance and fear of the dangers of moving, apparently contradictory, are in fact complementary and mutually necessary. That's 1912. Orwell, one of the century's greatest visionaries of advancement, imagining in the lion and the unicorn the conditions and structures and emotions leading to a revolutionary socialist England, or an homage to Catalonia, the contours of an enduring workers' utopia, is also one of the century's most effective artists of fear, illustrating in the vivid images and phrases of Animal Farm in 1984, the dangers of moving away from what we have and know. Light's investigation of the impact of interwar economic changes and technological developments that range from new cars, the wireless, to disposable sanitary napkins on the nation's interior life as it was reflected in and created by women. These women's books, which sustain the reading habits of the majority of British people, have everything to do with our investigations of the hypermasculine tramp soldier, writer, grocer, farmer, father, Orwell. For example, Light's description of the interior landscape of Daphne du Maurier's 1938 bestseller, Rebecca, she phrases it this way, the instability of being middle class, the treacherous and tricky limits to respectability, and the awkward insistence of desires which are strictly forbidden, Sounds uncannily like a description of the interior landscape of just about every novel and many essays and columns that Orwell wrote. Separated from Flory, Gordon Comstock, George Bowling, and Winston Smith by sex, class, and profession, Rebecca's nameless heroine speaks more powerfully than either downtrodden spinster Dorothy Hare or sexy swinger Julia to the complex desires of middle-class women for stability and change amidst the bewildering conditions of modernity. One of Light's key insights, an insight that feminism can give to Orwell studies, is that the conservative preoccupations we associate with Orwell's best and sometimes most sexist writing, a commitment to family life, to the idea of nationhood, to the notion of necessary authority and so forth, are in Light's words, not sealed off or separate from other ideological strains or existing apart from other quite conflicting, even contradictory desires and beliefs. Such contradiction leaves open that space in which human beings remake themselves and their societies, thus opening up Orwell's literature as a source of hope rather than despair in the possibilities for human change. Honest women. Orwell's readers, whether conservative or socialist, liberal or leftist, feminist or non-feminist, testify to the appeal of his purportedly transcendent and transparent values of human honesty and decency. Feminist readers of Orwell's literature may be more attuned than other kinds of readers to the overdetermined gendered valence, the, the contingency rather than universality of these two positive qualities. They may ask, what is an honest woman 
if we find her most easily and frequently in the idiom idiomatic phrase to make an honest woman of her. This made or manufactured honest woman is understood through her opposite, the dishonest woman, who is undisciplined, disreputable, and above all, sexually insubordinate. A woman who aspires to be honest may be one who undertakes to tell the truth, even awkward and uncomfortable feminist truths, but in doing so, she is also always confronting the idiomatic, honest woman who has agreed to conform to laws of church and state by ordering her heterosexual alliances through marriage. Similarly, a decent woman is never too far away from her opposite, the indecent woman. The indecent woman is by definition a too sexual woman, a too revealed and thus too honest woman. She is subject to a gendered etymology of the word that reserves synonyms of distasteful, immodest, indecorous, indelicate, unbecoming, and unseemly for women. And the more hearty and at times comically lovable symptoms of improper, vulgar, offending against good taste for men. Donald McGill, the postcard artist who is subject of one of Orwell's um, most famous essays, would by some mid-century readers be regarded as an indecent man. But he was never indecent in the same way that any middle-class woman of his time, Eileen O'Shaughnessy, for example, would be recognized as indecent. An indecent woman needs to put on a shirt. Whatever else he may need to do, uh, McGill or any other indecent man need not worry about his clothes. My point is that sexism and patriarchy are within language, in the words we inherit, in the value these words imply as they work across differently gendered bodies and minds. Feminist critics may regret an attempt to redress this historical fact, but most also play with it. What does feminism do for Orwell? It lets Orwell, by which I really mean discourse and discoursers about Orwell, have more fun. It can wring out the despair, deepen historical sensitivity, forge a sense of affiliation with communities new and old, along pathways leading not from but towards Orwell. In some ways, we can best see feminism's impact on Orwell studies in the changing approaches and concerns of men doing 21st century research on Orwell. Ben Clark's monograph, which I mentioned earlier, extends the research and reasoning of Pattaya to argue, among other things, that quote, the homophobia and anti-feminism exhibited in Orwell's texts obviously fulfill a multitude of functions, but both are used to construct a particular myth of masculinity. In contrast to Patai, Clark observes that Orwell's polarized model of gender, that's his words, is not extraneous to the ideas of justice, decency, and truth that Orwell supported, but rather integral to his socialism inscribed within it. Or here more recently is Richard Lance Keeble introducing his edited collection Orwell Today. Quote, let us be clear, Orwell was far from being a saint, um, nor the entirely decent chap he is constantly portrayed as. His attitudes to women were indeed pretty dodgy, and his constant affairs during his marriage may well have contributed to the sudden death of his wife, Eileen O'Shaughnessy, in 1945 from a broken heart. Whether or not this is feminist criticism, it is a perspective and an argument shaped by feminist ways of thinking about Orwell. Similarly, Darcy Moore's research on the women in Orwell's life, including his aunt Nellie Lamuzin and his friend Ruth Graves, shows thoughtful consideration of the way sexual bias in Orwell's time and beyond shaped his relations with supportive feminist friends and fa female family members and his rather sly disguise of those relations. The gold standard test of feminist influence upon Orwell scholarship is that which considers something Orwell never could imagine. Relations between women, whether in friendship or rivalry, that were the most important and central element of these women's emotional lives and the narrative worlds we construct about them. Can the writer imagine with Wolf that Chloe liked Olivia? For this kind of research, feminist scholars can look again to Beatrix Campbell, with all her obvious debts to Orwell, but also to D.J. Taylor, whose The Lost Girls, Love and Literature in Wartime London, um, is a collective biography of the women who worked for Cyril Connolly in the wartime offices of Horizon, demonstrates what Orwell, or rather Orwell biographers and scholars, can do for feminism. 
Taylor's touch is light, humorous, and engaging. His 21st century research on the women who, Sonia Braunel among them, Orwell in some ways envied and in obvious ways desired, deserves to be read alongside Allison Light's 20th century monograph on conservative modernity. Together, these books provide compelling answers to the questions, what can Orwell do for feminism and what can feminism do for Orwell? With a DJ Taylor, Allison Light approach to understanding Orwell and his literary culture, we can better ourselves understand how a man who defended honesty, decency, and truth in the name of the empires and the nation's poor and oppressed workers, a man who defied injustices of imperialism, capitalism, and totalitarianisms of all stripes, could hold fast to notoriously conservative views on gender, reactionary and obscene attitudes towards contraception, birth control, and abortion, and an ideology based on a gender polarization that assumes male centrality and superiority. And those are all citations of other scholars. These issues are as important for 21st as 20th century Orwell studies. So thank you for listening. <laughs>